Welcome to the second webinar in the 2023-2024 FCM Collective Series. Today's session is entitled Boosting the Visitor Economy, Enriching Communities, and Generating Opportunities for All. FCM is pleased to be collaborating with our partner, Destination Canada, to present this discussion today. My name is Evan Clark, and I'm the Manager of Partnerships and Sponsorship at FCM. We are pleased to be convening such an important conversation as Canada's visitor economy continues to make progress on a post-COVID recovery, and we ask ourselves, what comes next? As we move forward with our commitment to reconciliation, I want to acknowledge that FCM's head office is located on the unceded, unsurrendered territory of the Anishinaabe Algonquin Nation, whose presence here reaches back to time immemorial. As an organization, we endeavor to unlearn colonial mindsets and practices, grow in knowledge, and adapt our ways of working. As we continue to build meaningful relationships, we recognize the historic and ongoing contributions of Indigenous peoples and honor their leadership and partnership in shaping, shaping and strengthening communities across the country. I welcome you all to acknowledge the land you are joining us from. We have many members and colleagues, including municipal, nonprofit, academic, policy, and private sector leaders joining us from coast to coast to coast. It is the spectrum of perspectives FCM convenes that enables us to do the critical work we have in front of us. Today, if you'd like to ask a question, rather than using the raise hand function, please pose your questions in the chat. During the QA period towards the top of the clock, we'll attempt to get as many of your questions in as we can. Finally, I will note the session is be being recorded and will be available on demand on the FCM website. I would now like to introduce you to our moderator for today's session. Grayson Chungath is the Senior Vice President of Destination Development at Destination Canada, where she leads the organization's Pan-Canadian Strategy for Destination Development, focusing on strategic partnerships, stewardship of supply, development, and investment. Grayson is no stranger to municipal machinations. Prior to joining Destination Canada, she served at the City of Vancouver for eight years as Director of Strategic Operations, Planning, and Program Management. Safe to say you're among friends here today, Grayson. As Destination Canada supports the thoughtful evolution of the tourism sector, Grayson plays an important convening role in the country's transition to a thriving, community-centered, regenerative visitor economy that contributes to the socio-cultural, environmental, and economic wealth and well-being for all peoples of Canada. Over to you, Grayson. Thank you, Evan. Uh, it's always... Uh such a pleasant surprise when uh, I get introduced in such fanciful words, but thank you. And it's super greatly appreciated. Uh, so as I've mentioned, I am uh, Grayson Chunga, the Senior Vice President of Destination Development at Destination Canada. And I used to be at the city uh, and I actually used to work for a business unit called Arts, Culture and Community Services. So community came first, which is how we decided that at Destination Canada, as we were doing the work of destination development, we would be very community centric. That's where most of the work, the heart, the agency lies. We wanted to make sure that that was at the heart of the work that we did. So just to give you a sense of the day uh, for the hour, I'm going to be sharing a presentation on Destination Canada and how our work is with communities. After that, I will host a panel with three of the FCM mayors. Uh, one is Mayor Al Rain from Sun Peaks, BC, Mayor Richard Warnock from Sundry, Alberta, and Mayor Robert Rochon from Fundy, Alberta, in New Brunswick. Uh, and please note that our discussion will welcome questions from attendees. And please, as uh, Evan mentioned, they will be in, the, please put them in the chat in the Zoom function. Uh, please note that questions that come up in the presentation or discussion, we will have the opportunity to respond after we've had uh, the panel discussion. So with that, I will just get ourselves started for the presentation uh, on Destination Canada. Uh, so to start off, we are about uh, shifting it to the economy of the communities, and we want to make sure that we are generating all kinds of opportunity from a community-centric place. Yes, we definitely welcome visitors, but if we don't have a host, we don't really have a visitor economy. Next slide, please. Uh, so just to go through what we'll go through, we'll have about Destination Canada, I'll talk about our strategy. We'll talk about the role of destination development. 
uh, and then we'll have the panel discussion and then the audience questions. Next slide, please. So just wanted to give you an overarching view of what tourism means uh, to Canada. So we are a $45.2 billion uh, GDP contribution based on 2019. Uh, and the reason I bring it to 2019, that was at the peak of where we are. In 2023, we are coming very close to those numbers, but it is the most realistic and the most apt way of looking at what tourism has contributed to the country. Compared to other prominent sectors within the Canadian economy, tourism is estimated to be about the second largest of the contributors to GDP. And that is just right behind oil and gas, but ahead of forestry, fishing, agriculture, and telecom. Uh, tourism also generated $105 billion in revenue, including $77 billion from domestic tourism and $28 billion from the international revenue. So international tourism is a service export. They are the largest one we have in this country and accounts for about 19% of the service export. That's bigger than management consultants, financial services, et cetera. And when we think about these extra products like crude oil or vehicles or fishing products, tourism is amongst the top 10. And so just to give you another sense of the, the load that the this sector plays, they offer 232,000 tourism-related businesses are in operation in Canada, which means one in 10 jobs come out of the world of tourism. Next slide, please. So Destination Canada is a federal crown corporation. We are an agency of the federal government, and we're also sometimes known as the National Tourism Organization. We play a key role in driving the visitor economy in Canada. Uh, on the slide, you'll see the mandate that we follow fall under, which is a quite a broad mandate, and we are as a board have decided that we're going to be exercising the full mandate uh, and it started off in 2021. So until that point in time, we were mainly a marketing and a data related organization. And in its full mandate, we are also working on the supply side of the business. Uh, and in the aftermath of the pandemic, it was clearly realized that when we think about uh, growth, we have to be thinking about it smartly. We have to create it from a place of resilience to be able to rebound from free future disruptors, but also be able to adapt to shifting circumstances. Next slide, please. So as you saw our mandate, and one of the things that Destination Canada, we have deeply done, and I would say over the last three years, is think about what is our aspiration for our sector. Right. We wanted to make sure that we were embracing our mandate in its fullest sense. And we wanted to, and this is how we put it forward. We want to generate wealth and well being in its holistic sense uh, for Canada while enriching the lives of our guests, which means we want to increase business prosperity. We want to strengthen social cultural vibrancy and lift environmental sustainability through the work of tourism. Next slide, please. So when we think about how and where tourism happens, uh, we had to shift our thinking. Absolutely, visitors come, but they are between. There is an interaction between in a community. So it is where the host community welcomes the guest, which is the visitor. And the best chance of success in its most positive experience is having the guests have aligned values or shared community values. And the host needs to exercise agency in a decision making and actually understand the value of what tourism means in their community. So it's not just happening to them. They actually have agency and indicate how they want to see that tourism actually happen. So they have an influence on what that smart growth looks like. What does development look like? What does the indigenous engagement look like in all of those aspects in its fullest form? Next slide, please. Uh, so in the summer of 2023, the federal, the Ministry of Tourism uh, launched a federal tourism growth strategy, which is named Canada 365, welcoming the world every day. To support this federal tourism growth strategy, Destination Canada has is going to be releasing its own 2024-2030 strategy to help achieve the federal targets, but also go 
well beyond that. And of course, we are staying true to our aspiration, which is, you know, we, we do generate wealth and well-being for all of Canada. I, I do want to say that when we talk, talk about wealth and well-being, it is all kinds of wealth. It is not just economic wealth, but it's social, cultural wealth, environmental wealth, language wealth in its fullest sense, because if it is tipped to any one direction, it is comes at the loss of the other. Uh, next slide, please. So to guide our work, DC is stewarded by five principles. One is collaboration. And the reason I say that is we are a very small organization of 100 people, and we work absolutely hand in glove with our partners across the territories and the provinces and also the cities and the municipalities that ha that are in the world of tourism. We engage with them in an ongoing basis, uh, quarterly, sometimes even more often. And we also work together on setting priorities for the future and how we work with the ministry in terms of funding or policy or any of those kind of work. Prosperity is the second guiding principle. And that is to ensure that our businesses that actually create the experiences and even create employment and create resilience between in tourism communities has the ability to grow and there's a full ecosystem of them so they are truly thriving and flourishing as an ecosystem the third one is public support and policy we work in partnership with many of our national sector associations we're very honored and blessed to have this conversation with FCM because at its heart, our hosts are every municipality across the country. Uh, and so that becomes a fundamental place for us to work together on how we do tourism. The fourth one is regeneration. And this is coming from a place that it's not enough to be sustainable or to just make do. We have to be in a place where we are actually contributing to that comedy community in a net positive manner, that there are net benefits to the people and the community that stay there, that when an infrastructure or piece of accommodation comes in, the profits actually stay within that community, they're not moved out. So that regeneration, the fundamental basic principle of regeneration, which moves beyond sustainability is another guiding principle. And last is the reconciliation. Everything we do, we want to connect people and the land and make sure that we are in truth and in balance and actually serving the needs of that and in that we have reconciled with the indigenous people as well. Uh, those are our five guiding principles. It is the lens, it is the it's how we see every component of our work that we get done. Next slide please. We have four strategic drivers in how we're going to push our 2030 strategy forward. Uh, it's collective intelligence, destination development, brand leadership, and sector advancement. I'll go into a little bit so you got to have a sense of what I'm talking about. Uh, in collective intelligence, as I mentioned, we have been a research-driven organization for a very long time, but we're actually moving from pure research to actually insights. And there's going to be six dimensions that we've focused on, strategy, people, process, logic, data, and technology. Uh, we want to have this both from the data, the demand side, which helps give us deep customer insights to show, build rich and connected actual ecosystems of the tourism intelligence and the supply side of the data in identifying areas of opportunity and mechanisms for policymakers to support greater industry prosperity. The second one is destination development. I'll just touch on it because there is a future slide that I go into a bit more detail, which is the business unit that I uh, manage. Uh, Destination Canada is really helping the welcomeness of our destinations by working with communities and communities that string together to form corridors to create a long-term destination development strategies. We want to identify new tourism infrastructure, but also invest in existing in tourism infrastructure, uh, products and services, support productivity of the workforce, access and experiences required to meet evolving needs, and expectations of visitors, but primarily, it if it is serving the community and its residents, it will serve the visitor. The third part of the strategic driver is the brand leadership, and that is just how we show up as Canada in the world 
and why people would come to us just based on our values driven and who we market ourselves to be. We are actively moving towards something called high values guests. That is, you know, instead of marketing to everybody and everything, we're going to be targeting we see guests that have aligned values with shared Canadian values so that we have a track leisure and both business events, which is like the big conferences and things like that to the country so that we are true drivers of community uh, and actually the economics and the profits stay within that community. Uh, interestingly, these also resonate with a very strong uh, guest uh, or a visitor, and we're just making sure that we are targeting our all our marketing efforts towards that one. The fourth one is sector advancement. And just coming out of the pandemic, we realized that in order to be stronger and more profitable and more resilient, we need to come from a place where we were thinking about comp complex facets of our ecosystem. So that we, in our, in order to be competitive and not just be world, but to just be resilient, we needed to shift from like, just the number of people that were showing up and we needed to work towards revenue and yield. Uh, how do we increase thoughtful investment into our sector and into our communities? How do we improve access in and within, into the country and within the nation? And how is it workforce productivity, the rigid, digital readiness, regenerative business practices, deep and true community engagement and reconciliation with the indigenous people? Next slide, please. So what is destination development? So if you think about from an economics point of view, from the supply side and the demand side, marketing would be seen as the demand side and supply would be destination development. How do we work with our partners to create economic zones or enough reasons and journeys for people to come to Canada and stay within Canada to experience what we want to offer our authenticity but also to be able to just enjoy it in a slow form and actually in, take in what the country has to offer, the people, the place, and the culture. Next slide, please. So in terms of uh, when we think about destination development, I want to just give you a flavor. I won't go into two, there are many blocks here, but these are, when you do the work, they become extremely significant, but I'll give it to you at a very high level. Uh, in a resilient community, there are six elements in tourism destination development, and these are generally very well woven into an official community plan or economic development strategy, or it sits as a subset or a subsector within uh, those official plans. There are six elements to it. The first one is environmental integrity. We want to make sure that in the world of tourism, as we work through it, we care about the bioregions the biodiversity index, the flora, the fauna, the ecosystems. And they are not just about increasing them, but they're actually also about preserving them and having a multi-generational point of view. The second one is infrastructure access and amenities. And this is how do residents live, work, and play within your community and how do they move around, sleep, eat, and communicate. The third one is collaboration. Are right players engaged? and part of the development process and the people that need to have agency, do they know they have the agency and are they exercising it in an ongoing and timely basis? So they have ownership about what's happening within their region. Experience development is not just about infrastructure of tourism assets, but it's ensuring that they are aligned with the community values. And the last one is tourism workforce. Have we created communities in addressing the labor shortage? Are they offered good career paths, not just not just entry-level jobs, but they actually can have, and do they have access to housing that this community, this workforce actually needs? Next slide, please. Uh, so one of the things that we did is uh, we contracted an external agency to help us with just kind of reevaluating or reassessing to see what is the role of Destination Development Canada, because it happens at a very regional level. And we wanted to make sure that uh, we weren't getting into spaces which were competing with places where they were actually already doing it well. So there were five things that came out that were important. Uh, we need to lead certain elements, such as like a regenerative approach to tourism or thought leadership. We had a role to convene 
groups across the country, supporter, leader, resourcer, and founder. Uh, next slide, please. So in the destination development strategy, uh, we, we launched it and we said we would do a roadmap for three years. We're a relatively new business, so we didn't want to think too long out. Our work lasts multi-generationally, but we put plans in place and the work that we were going to do just over a three-year period. Next slide, please. So there are three main elements, uh, and I'll get into a little bit more about each one. There's a corridor strategy, there's destination development expertise, and there's investment attraction and policy that we want to go through in uh, the things that we're going to deep dive in the next three years. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so I'm just going to give you a sense of our roadmap. I've highlighted a few things in there that will be that may or be of interest to you. Uh, the first one is I talk about is the corridor strategies. And so we launched a 2023 corridor, tourism corridor strategy program. We had 16 submissions, which were cross-border corridor development across the country. Three of them were selected. Uh, one was the Northern Indigenous Lodge Network, which is the youngest of all of them. Uh, and they are the ones building the case for network on Indigenous owned and operated lodging in the Yukon, Northwest Territories and Northern BC. Atlantic Canada's UNESCO corridor sites, which has 13 UNESCO designated sites across three provinces. And the Sustainable Journeys, which is from BC to Alberta, uh, Alberta on the Highway 3. Another one would I would say is the Tourism Scapes, which is a GIS mapping program, which is mapping all the tourism assets across the country. But it also includes other assets like the transport and the areas, the population. And this might be of interest to communities. As you think about your own regions, it might be a place for us to interact. We would be happy to offer this GIS map to anybody within uh, the country so we can work together on how to develop these assets. Um, and some of the others are like a regenerative approach to tourism on how we think about it holistically uh, and then social return on investment, ensuring that when we have investments come into the region, we have really thought about not just about the economic impact, but about all the social impacts that happen when an investment of this nature comes in. And last but not least, I would say is that we're doing a rural destination study across Canada. And I'm sure that we will be engaging with some or a lot of you as we do that work. With that, I would like to say thank you for taking, giving me the time and the opportunity to present some of the work that Destination Canada does uh, and the work of Destination Development. With this, I'd like to transition uh, to the panel discussion. Uh, so it is now my pleasure to introduce our panel today. They are comprised of three uh, awesome human beings with vast experience in tourism development in their communities. Mayor Al Rain is currently in his fifth term as the mayor of Sun Peaks, a resort community in British Columbia, in British Columbia's interior. Prior to living in Sun Peaks, Mayor Rain was named Freeman, the resort municipality of Whistler, in recognition of his key role in the development of the Whistler Resort from a weekend ski area to a successful destination resort. Welcome, Mayor Rain. Uh, Mayor Richard Warnock is in his second term on council, his first as the elected mayor of the town of Sundry, Alberta. Mayor Warnock has led his council to become an investment friendly destination and has embarked on an ambitious plan to attract new residents and development, including new co-founding the first rural film office in Alberta. Thank you for joining us, Mayor Warnock. Mayor Robert Roshan was originally elected in the village of Hillsborough in New Brunswick, but now serves as the mayor of Fundy, Alberta, a new community created as a result of community reform. Mayor Roshan is a member of the rural Upper Bay, Upper Fundy Partnership, a community-based focus on destination development in the Upper Bay of Fundy in New Brunswick. It's great to see you again, Mayor Roshan. Now let's jump into our discussion today. Welcome. Uh, so I'll start with Mayor Roshan uh, as a first question. Uh, how has tourism been an agent of change in your community? 
Well, first of all, thank you for having me today. Uh, it's uh, it's an honor to be with you. So tourism for most communities uh, has and continues to play an important role in the success of our local and regional economy. So over the years, the tendency has been one where we focus tourism through the local community lens, as though we were competing against one another for scarce uh, tourism resources. With the recent implementation of the local governance reform and the amalgamation of communities in New Brunswick, we've come to realize that a collaborative approach and one, uh, one that involves others yields the best results as it relates to tourism. So as a member of the Rural Upper Fundy Partnership, a working group that's focused on regional destination development model with two other municipalities in New Brunswick, neighboring municipalities, we're developing a regional destination development strategy complete with tools for tourism operators and digital solutions to enhance our visitor experience. Uh, cool. So just uh, if I, I probably should have mentioned it when I was presenting. So one of our corridors that we're working on, thank you, uh, Mayor, is actually in the UNESCO, uh, UNESCO areas, the 13 Atlantic and the Upper Bay of Fundy is one of the UNESCO and the bar region. So I have I'm, I feel very lucky to actually have been into that region. It is gorgeous. If anybody has a chance, you should absolutely go up there. Uh, Mayor Rain or Mayor Warnock, do you have any comments or any thoughts on how tourism has been an agent of change in your community? Yes, I can go first if that's okay. Um, here in Sundry, we're still in the first steps of tourism development. However, with the beautification and place meeting efforts to support our, our drawing our, and drawing of people into our community. It has also had the effect of drawing in more commercial and industrial development than the community has seen in over a generation. This includes eating, drinking establishments, retail stores, and many other industries that support tourism. This becomes a benefit that we see almost every day. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Green. Yeah, our, our situation, uh, by the way, um, we are on the traditional territory of the Squamish people. Yeah, our situation is quite different. We are a purpose built tourism community. We have no other industry other than tourism. And just to give you a perspective, um, in 19, 1995, the assessed values of properties in Sun Peaks was about $25 million. Today, it's $1.4 billion. Uh, we have grown from a population of about 100 people in 95 to more than 1,500 today. So we've had tremendous growth, but um, much of our growth is coming from uh, international markets. In fact, 37% of all our overnight guests are from out of country and 55% are out of province. So, and, and the big difference there is the out of country people, especially the Australian, New Zealand, the US market, those visitors are spending about $500 per day per person in the resort. So they're, they are, spending a, a lot of money. Um, so uh, I, our situation is totally different. I mean, we're, we are completely focused on tourism. Uh, thank you, Mayor Rain. So just to continue with you, having been part of the development of two resort communities, both Whistler and Sunbeaks, how do you balance the visitor economy and with the resident quality of life? Yeah, uh, again, um, you know, the being purpose built. I mean, we un, I think most of the people, certainly in Sun Peaks, completely understand that uh, without tourists, um, we're not here. No tourists, no residents. I mean, the, the jobs are totally tourism created. Whistler was very similar in the beginning when I was involved there. I mean, I have seen Whistler today is. You know, in, in the days when I was there, it was 2,000 people. Today, it's 12,000 people. And there is a little bit community versus tourism environment. 
but I would still say the vast majority of people in Whisper completely understand that their livelihood, their lives are driven by tourism. You know, in, in our community, I mean, we have kilometers of walking, biking trails. We have a, a rink with a roof on it. We have alpine cross-country skiing. I mean, the investment there is uh, in the $300 million range. We have an 18-hole golf course. We have te te tennis, pickleball, community parks. N no community of 1,500 people has all those kinds of facilities. Now, sometimes the facilities are taken up in priority by tourists. But there are other softer periods when the community gets full access to all of these things. So I think our, our community appreciates. We have facilities and a lifestyle that you wouldn't find in most small rural communities. I think that goes down to uh, communities having agency, right? When they know what they want and why they want it, they are more welcoming of the visitors and they understand why that balance needs to happen rather than when it happens to them and they are not fully engaged. You kind of miss that. And this one is where there's been a good balance between the visitor economy and how it's impacting the computer or not necessarily impacting, impacting in a negative way, how it positively impacts that community and how it is an economic driver for them. Any thoughts on this, Mayor Roshan and Mayor Warnock? I know it's not Whistler or Sun Peaks, but in your own regions, how do you, is there, has there been, has it come to a brim where there needs to be a conversation between the balance between the visit economy and the residents? Yes, I can go ahead with that. Go ahead, uh, Mayor uh, Warnock. Th thank you. Uh, so when you, when you try and lead your community, um, sometimes they're they're out there asking questions, is tourism the only answer? But when you diligently focus on increasing amenities such as parks, recreation facilities, promotional arts and culture centers, celebration of Indigenous peoples, it increases the community pride. And once they get involved in that, you've got them hooked. So as long as our plans for tourism are developed consciously and with the community in mind, tourism will contribute to a positive quality of life for our residents as well. And this increases learning and growing attitude for tourism in our community. So we try and promote that uh, whenever we get the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Werner. Uh, Mayor Rashan. Yeah, so for the most part, our residents understand that the visitor economy is important to local business and by default to the residents themselves. It's what keeps our restaurants open and our economy vibrant. We can't, however, lose sight of the fact, and we try not to do that, to lose sight of the impacts that the visitors have on our local residents, whether it's for the use of our trails, whether it's for them to be able to access services. We try to strike a balance so that both can coexist and uh, and complement one another. Uh, I mean, we have we have some of the uh, some of the best tourist attractions in Eastern Canada. So we bring through probably in the range of 300,000 visitors in the run of a summer. And so that's a that's a lot of traffic through our community. So we, we need to be mindful of the impacts that that has on our population. Thank you, uh, Mayor Roshan. Uh, Mayor Warnock, this question is for you. Uh, and how can you host how can hosting guests support community building and investment in quality of life? Because you've mentioned that investment has been one of your primary interest outcomes on having done a tourism, uh, in a, being in a tourism economy. Yes, thank you. You know, we thought about placemaking as it pertains to tourism, and we wanted to focus on our community central approach at the very core of our planning. If you think about the public spaces that people like to visit and enjoy and the places that locals and visitors typically come together or enjoy, such again as eating and drinking establishments, parks, live music events, and other experiences, it becomes very important to consider how the community would benefit from these experiences, in addition to the benefits of our visitors. For example, Sundrig is a community that embraces a healthy, active, inclusive lifestyle so our motivation became the pathway to well-being based on the five goals of the framework 
for recreation in Canada 2015. This means that all of our placemaking plans and projects we have completed, such as our brand new boardwalk, are completely barrier free, and that they align with the healthy active lifestyle of our residents, which benefits our tourism industry when they come to our facilities and our towns. From an investment perspective, the economics of nature-based recreational activities top the charts in visitor spending. Sundry is also blessed to have two world-class, international, market-ready, indigenous tourism operators in our area. We have been working very closely with both of these operators for a number of years and have developed an outstanding working relationship with both, and this leads to great economic development. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor Warnock. It's great to see that uh, having that social purpose and having the access to broader broader services and amenities to the residents makes it so much more important and makes it so much easier to set, not even sell, but to embrace the idea of why tourists need to be in your region because they kind of, it's a symbiotic relationship. You know, you have one, you have the other, but they kind of work hand in hand and both of them actually enjoy you offer. And it's, it's a great economic driver and a social driver and social, social cohesion as you go through that work. Um, so as you think about uh, tourism in each of your regions. And this is kind of a question for any of you. Uh, let me know who wants to go first. What do you see as the biggest hurdle in the world of tourism in your region for the next five to 10 years? Who wants to go first? Uh, I, I can I, go ahead. I can, I can go, go ahead, first. Sir. So for us in our region, uh, there are really, there are two big hurdles. One is workforce attraction and being able to provide adequate housing for the workforce because we're physically uh, the, the 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 most popular of our tourist destinations is a community that's about 90 kilometers away from uh, the city of Moncton so attracting workforce and being able to find housing for them is a is a challenge the next one is adequate infrastructure the community of Alma which is right next to Fundy National Park has a population, a, a wintertime population of about 250 people. But in the summertime, there's upwards of 5,000 people a week that go through that community. And we have a very limited uh, water system. And uh, so much so that if you pay any attention to what's been going on in some of the local news, is that our water supply is actually being depleted throughout the summer. So fortunately, we were able to get a $12 million investment by the provincial and federal governments to increase the capacity of that water supply to meet our, uh, our near-term and future needs. Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor Warnock. Who wants to go next? This becomes, you know, putting in huge load on the municipality like how does the balance of the tax base to support those needs as the visitors grow does anybody else have a yeah i'm happy to jump in behind mayor Rochon. you know there unfortunately in the political taxation structure that we live in uh, there is no means for most municipalities to uh share in the revenue generated by tourists. And this is a major, major problem for Canada, in my estimation. Uh, the the cost that Mayor Rochon was talking about, if you have 10 times uh, the visitors to local population, you need an infrastructure that is three or four times bigger than your local population need. And you need to build attractions. I mean, we have uh, basically three ways to bring in investment funds, uh, taxation, grants, or the private sector. You know, and in Sun Peaks, we've been able to attract the private sector, as, as I said earlier, $1.4 billion in, in chalets, hotels, and the tourism infrastructure. But when it comes to expanding tourism attractions, managing the day-to-day -day cost of tourism, uh, it's very difficult to put that on the backs of the local residents through property taxes. Mm -hmm. You know, if we look around the rest of the world, bed tax is 
generally going to municipalities. Uh, in most U.S. resorts, uh, they have a, a local sales tax. And in fact, when I look at our arrivals in Colorado, Vail, Aspen, they take in about uh, three to four times more revenue in sales tax than in property taxes. Uh, hard to compete against that kind of uh, funding. Uh, thank you. That those are both of those points are super important. And tax has always been the issue when it comes down to tourism and how that distribution, how the where it comes, the input in and the distribution. Mia Warnock, any views on this? Yes, uh, it, it you know we always say it comes down to funding, and and that's probably the truth. Is I agree with uh, with Mayor Rain as to where you get these dollars to make that happen. As most communities are are facing uh, difficulties with their infrastructure, the shortage of housing is paramount, and it makes it difficult, like Mayor Rashan said, to attract the labor force to your community to develop tourism. But in addition, many communities and municipalities here around us are, are facing a reduction in volunteerism, which puts the burden on our municipal staffing requirements. So it, it becomes a, an all around co co uh, compass and focus as to where we want to point the needle at a certain time to make it work better for our community. So we're working on trying to figure out those scopes and paths almost constantly to where we can make it work to make for the attraction purposes. We need the workers and we need the money. Thank you. Uh, yeah, if, if I could just add one other complication. In most resort communities, um, real estate is expensive. The cost of living is higher than in non-resort communities. And in fact, uh, housing for local residents is priced, uh, pricing the local resident right out of the market. And in fact, uh, our, our strategy now is to make sure that we have non-market housing for residents mm -hmm. and employee housing uh, for the seasonal employees. Very difficult, again, comes down to funding, but uh, provide those uh, non-market housing and employee housing units there has to be some subsidy at some somewhere, and and that's a, that's a major issue, uh, no question. I, mean, I look at uh, the average ho home price in Sun Peaks today is probably closer to two million dollars. It's out of reach for any working uh, employee in in Sun Peaks. So non-market housing, housing where only the employees and residents of the community can buy in and sell out of is critical. Not so easy, easily said, but not so easily accomplished. But those are things that are fundamental when you think about uh, uh, tourism development and as you think about multi-generationally. Right, because if you want to think about having getting enough labor force to come in, if you haven't secured housing for them, you're not going to act like it becomes like this virtual circle, and you need to make sure that you're thinking about it. And yes, as you said, easier said than done. It's one thing when, as you're growing a municipal, a growing a resort municipality, you know, it's everything's fine. And as it gets to a level of maturity, those things begin to come into play, and you almost uh, wish that you know that the tax base and the granting and uh, the bed taxes all kind of supported that so they could make it work and so it wouldn't always be in a, in a place of stress. Um, I'm, I'm going to ask uh, if people have questions, please begin to put it in the chat. I have one last question for the panelists and then uh, we can move to questions. I just want to say, think about, you know, when you do think about the most helpful change in terms of like policy, or and tax intervention, and you've mentioned some of those things. But if you had to, like, you know, really stress and say, okay, this is the one thing that would make to catalyze tourism, uh, aka the hosting economy in your region, what would that be? That one policy or the one policy intervention that you would think about? Uh, funding. Go ahead. <laughs> funding. No, uh, absolutely, on the funding side, and I should point out. 
in British Columbia, there is a municipal regional district tax, and that's uh, simple terms, 3% on accommodations. And that goes back to the local communities to be used by the destination marketing organizations to market the community. But it's, it is significant. And in addition, there are 14 resort municipalities and they get a portion of the hotel tax back. And that's also significant funding. So we actually do have a funding source that is outside of uh, property taxes and, and local fees. And that has helped. Is it enough? Um, no, because, it, and it is the accommodation sector that's carrying the load there uh, and and the provincial Ministry of Finance to a smaller portion. But um, no, there's no question, funding is, uh, is a critical matter for rural communities. For the biggest cities, not that's quite the same issue. Oh, I think they need funding too. They just want it for different reasons. So I don't think that yes. it always holds true. No, uh, it, it's different for them. Yes. Uh, Mayor Rashan, Mayor Warnock. Uh, I can I can go next uh, to to build on what Mayor Rain has mentioned in New Brunswick uh, with the local governance reform. There was this concept of fiscal reform that was going to go along with that, and the Union of Municipalities of New Brunswick has been lobbying the provincial government to look at fiscal reform in the light of perhaps transferring some of that tax, the sales tax revenue and other revenues from uh, fuel back to the municipalities where it's needed the most. But in terms of more practical measures that our municipality can take, I think if we look at uh, influencing land use planning and zoning to make it easier for businesses to set up and thrive is essential. Encouraging development in the more rural areas of our community can add to the tourism offerings, making rural tourism more appealing to visitors. So we have our, in our community, we have really three uh, former incorporated municipalities with a lot of rural area in between. So if we're able to allow growth in those rural areas, it'll give our visitors more options when they visit. So thank you. Mayor Warnock? You're on mute. Mute. Muted, yeah. <laughs> Uh, yes, it, it was difficult to pick one, but when I was running it through my, my come up with a couple, but I, I'll be trying to be uh, as quick as I can. But, you know, first, the ease and access of criteria for grants. Currently, the red tape reduction that, that uh, is with grant funding, the red tape is associated and it's excessive. Municipalities have been asked to reduce red tape, but when other levels of government do not reduce it, it just makes our work mute. So we need to work on some of that to try and get in into this process so, uh, so we can get access to these funds. The second is the international and interprovincial tourism marketing focus is now starting to be inclusive of rural communities and muni rural municipalities such as ours, rather than just the already established tourism destinations such as Banff, Jasper and the bigger cities. With a refocus on marketing to be inclusive of rural destinations, this is a critical focus change that helps rural communities to attract visitors from other countries and other provinces. Also, the Sundry and Cochrane area being selected by Travel Alberta as one of the 10 tourism development zones that has high potential for tourism growth, this has helped our community. Stakeholders in the zone are interested in regenerative tourism meaning the tourism that's developed that is conscious of the environment and contributes to the local economy. The zone's key product offerings are rivers, sports, Western, Indigenous culture and heritage, and the soft adventures. And when we when we think of that in the red tape reduction, we're streamlining, we're streamlining our business and licensing program to the best of our ability, and it has really uh, showed up in our community. So there are some things that we are working on but the most helpful change is uh, is really being out there and being focused. Thank you. So just to summarize, uh, just uh, the three top things for each of them, uh, funding, physical reform, land use planning, 
uh, and the third one is easy access to grants through and just the the removal of red tape. And with that, uh, and thank you very much. This is very very may, helpful. May Go may ahead. Just, uh, one other issue. I mean, with the expansion we've gone through, we have to expand our water and our wastewater services. We apply for a grant. Uh, there's three hundred, four hundred million dollars in federal provincial funding on the infrastructure side, but there's 800 million in applications. So, you know, 30%, 35% of communities are successful. And in our case, we're under pressure to expand, not, not successful with the grant application. Now you're funding 100% of the costs, uh, uh, which is huge for the community. As a result of that, you know, our community now has excessive debt loads. We had to go in spite of the fact that we weren't successful with the federal provincial grant application uh, because it's underfunded. That's uh, super helpful and actually very apt because um, one of the things that we uh, and Perhaps maybe after this session, we will have uh, a time and I have a colleague with me, Jennifer, at some point, and we have to talk about how, what is the role of senior levels of government and what is their role in actually supporting these things at a very meaningful level in order to actually alleviate some of those pressures and what is the actual role between the three levels, the four levels in the indigenous communities as well, on how can we actually take these roles and actually alleviate and so that tourism is actually serving the communities and it's not landing up becoming burdensome. It's actually offering community services and all the things that does. And actually, just in the joy of actually hosting visitors. With that, I will pass it to Evan, who's going to help us with questions. Uh, sure. Thanks, Grayson. Uh, and excellent discussion so far. We have time for probably a handful of questions here. Uh, and the first one that I'm going to bring to the group is from Brian Kant. He's wondering, it's a question about balancing, really. How does sustainability and regenerative tourism get factored into enriching communities? Uh, uh, I can let one of the mayors go. Does anybody want to go first? Yeah, happy to. Uh, I'm going to uh, say, uh, you know, the sustainability is the essence of what we're doing. Often people say, uh, gee, how important is the environment uh, to Sun Peaks? Critical. We will not have visitors if we have uh, environmental issues that are unacceptable to the to the average Canadian or average international visitor. I mean, it's critical that uh, you maintain the quality of your streams and uh, the fauna. And, I mean. International market go nuts when they see bear and deer running all over the ski slopes in the summer. I mean that's that's part of the our message. That's part of what we sell. It's critical. Yeah, and I would I would reiterate on top of that as well that the environment's very important, and we try and keep it uh, as as close to to standard as we can. Uh, here in Sundry, we believe in pristine waters in and pristine waters out. So the, we're, we're trying a new testing facility for that, for our new uh, wastewater treatment plant. And we do believe that it's important that we keep that in mind all the time. Thank you. And from our part with the, uh, the Rural Upper Fundy Partnership, uh, regenerative tourism is at the heart of what we're trying to accomplish. And at the same time, uh, what we have done is we are actually linking some of our programs, activities to the UN Sustainable Development Goals, the 17 that are there. That are there. Uh, our group has focused in on four particular sustainable development goals. And because the visitorship that we get are different than the visitors that we would have gotten 20 years ago, folks are demanding uh, that we be very cognizant of our impact on the environment and on the water. So uh, that's one of the reasons why we've endorsed that. Uh, and I'll just offer from just a national perspective, I think it is one of the reasons why we attract so many visitors to Canada is just we are seen as we're perceived as seen as being extremely caring of our environment and putting that at the forefront. 
it's just is important that we follow through on that. And, you know, when I hear about like wildlife policy and things like that, that are happening across in each of these municipalities, uh, it's amazing. And we actually have the, we had this great speaker at the international symposium who actually spoke about, he did not think tourism and wildlife policy could go together, but it's absolutely essential because that is one of the reasons why people do come and people within Canada appreciate their own country. Yeah, and the other part of sustainability is good planning and good management. I mean, uh, you have to have a good plan. Uh, Excellent. Evan, do you want to go um, to the next question? Yeah. So uh, Diana Mulvey has a question uh, about performance indicators. So what performance indicators and metrics beyond typical economic measures like occupancy levels should communities consider for destination development and management? Um, I can I can speak to it and then I can let the mayor go ahead, Mayor Rain. If you have something, we'll let's hear let's hear from you. Yeah, I, I, I was going to say, you know, employment of your residents is key. One of the things that Canada faces is seasonality. You know, there are, uh, in, in most of the country and there's winter, summer. Uh, you know, I've often thought, thank God I've been in the business where our main tourism attraction is in the winter months. And when 80% of Canadians are vacating, on vacation uh, in the summer months, we're out there trying to fish. And it's a lot better to fish when the fish are running. So it's, it's a bit easier when you have a strong winter season. But we still suffer, you know, 65% or more of our economy happens in five months. That's a $139 million economy today. That's happening in five months. We still have to keep people working and employed in the off season. And, and, and that's a measure that I think as a community you, you wanna follow. One one objective that uh, that we have in in our region is that, uh, as Mayor Rain mentioned, they seem to be focused around a seasonable a season uh, a seasonal tourist season. What we're trying to do is expand that to into the shoulder season, and in time, build that so that it's a three hundred and sixty five day uh, a year uh, industry. So. That is ultimately what we're working towards. So other than the economic prosperity and uh, performance indicators, uh, a performance indicator for us would be to able to expand the length of our season. Yes, and I, I can I, keep my comments to myself. I'll, I'll speak another time. If I could just uh, say one thing is that we try to work into our service level documents uh, how we can deal with this to make it year-round tourism. We get twenty to 30,000 uh, people that go through our municipality, through our little town, every weekend in, in the summer months. And so we're the opposite of Mayor Rain and the, the winter world. So we're working very hard to build it into our service levels so we can get year-round tourism as a focus. And I think that will work into our new municipal development plan, which is currently being drafted. And, oh. and I would caution to say, uh, dealing with the off season is, again, easier said than done. <laughs> that's uh, that's real work. <laughs> oh, I, I do have one. I do want to talk about this employment thing, and this becomes really important, is that seasonal employment is a great opportunity for people to get into the workforce. But what you and you, when you can... Uh, commits to having year-round employment that actually offers benef benefits for employees. You land up having better way of managing labor shortage because people can actually make a living and have a household and things like that. And that's a longer term game. So somehow we can, you know, work towards moving from seasonality to actually having this full full season dispersion. It actually makes it a much more compelling sector for people to be have employment in. Just gonna yep. close it here. Um, 
Thank you, Grayson. Uh, thank you to our panelists, Mayor Rain, Mayor Roshan, Mayor Warnock, and a final thank you to Destination Canada. Uh, we appreciate you sharing your local expertise and making it available to all of our members here. Um, we'll be posting a recording of this session to fcm.ca in the coming days, so please uh, feel free to share this as a resource with your colleagues. And if you enjoyed today's conversation, please join us for our next collective webinar on January 31st, where we will be discussing the opportunities and obstacles related to standing up biogas or renewable natural gas projects in your community. Happy holidays, everyone. Thank, Thank you, you everybody. Thank you, Mayors. Thank Bye. you. Thanks, Evan.